Hello, my name is Talib Küçükcan. Welcome to the TRT World Forum Digital Debates. Today, we are going to look at different aspects of Cyprus issue, especially starting with the presidential elections in the northern part of the island, in the Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus. And also, we will be looking at some of the geopolitical issues that surround the uh, Cyprus island. Today, uh, I have uh, a guest, uh, an expert on the uh, issues that we are going to discuss. Uh, he is Professor Hussein Ushuksal. Let me introduce him to you first, then we will go on to our debate. Professor Ushuksal completed his MA at the University of Warwick in the United Kingdom. He has two PhDs, actually. One is from uh, Kiel University uh, from United Kingdom. The other one is from the Department of Politics and International Relations from the Middle East Technical University. Since 2002, he has worked in several universities. He taught and lectured on uh, international relations, and he is the editor of many books uh, on the uh, subject. In 2014, Professor Ushiksal was appointed as one of the members of the consultative committee of the Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus Presidency for Negotiations. So he was involved in the negotiation efforts. He is the nearest university representative of the Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus Higher Education Supervision and Accreditation Board International Relations Planning and Coordination Group. So he has many titles, as you can see. Uh, Hussein Ushiksal, welcome to our program. Thank you very much for uh, joining us today. Uh, as I said, we will be talking about the presidential elections in the northern part of the island, but also geopolitical developments. Maybe we can start with the geopolitical uh, crises, tensions and developments that are now unfolding in the region and its impact in the Cyprus issue. What is your reading of the recent developments? Uh, professor, first of all, uh, thank you for inviting me and giving me this opportunity to uh, talk about Cyprus politics uh, as well as the regional developments and regional politics. Uh, as we know, um, we are having very uh, heated uh, debates actually nowadays about the Eastern Mediterranean. And for my own view, uh, what's the problem on the land is now expanded to the sea. So uh, for so long, uh, international community go unnoticed of uh, Cyprus issue, uh, go unnoticed of the status of Turkish Cypriots. But with the discovery of these hydrocarbon resources now, the unsettlement of the Cyprus dispute is somehow locked all the other developments in, in my uh, personal view. So um, when we look at the, at the, the major problem in, in, in Cyprus is the Greek Cypriot administration is occupied Cyprus, occupied all its positions, and Turkish Cypriots who are the founding uh, members of the Republic of Cyprus are simply dismissed from the Republic. So um, the, another paradox is, if the Republic of Cyprus is 1960 Republic, like established in 1960, then Turkey Cypriots should be there in all decision-making mechanisms. For instance, on the European Union membership process, uh, according to the uh, three treaties that constitute the Republic of Cyprus, uh, first of all, Cyprus cannot be member of any uh, union, any, any organization where Turkey and member, Turkey and Greece are both member. And secondly, in such a cr critical decision, uh, Turkish Cypriot vice president should also uh, use his veto power or decision power. So like this, many of the international law breaks and Greek Cypriots are acting as uh, like the unipolar and the only authority in, in, in Cyprus. But the thing is, <laughs> Turkish Cypriots are living on the islands like more than 450 years. And Turkish Cypriots are actually controlling uh, you know, some part of the Cyprus since 1964. So, in fact, they kick off from the, uh, from the Republic, they expel from the Republic, they treat it like they don't exist. But when you look at the United Nations Security Council resolutions, you see that even in the United Nations Security Council resolution saying that so-called Republic of Cyprus is not effectively controlled some parts of Cyprus. So, Turkish Cypriots somehow control their areas, then after the 74 uh, Turkish intervention, Turkish Cypriots for the first time after so many years, able to uh, like collect it in one part of the country. And then after uh, one year later, 75, we established Turkish Cypriot federal state. In, uh, when we established Turkish Cypriot federal state, we don't demand, we didn't demand any international recognition because our purpose is there are two, uh, 
people in Cyprus to people as a uh, people who can use the right of self-determination. So we call the Greek side, Greek counterparts, let's establish a uh, federal um, country together where there, it will be bi-zonal, bi-federal federation. So nine years, Turkish Cypriots patiently uh, wait for Greek Cypriots to come to the negotiation table, but none of them bring any positive results. And then in 1983, as you know, uh, Turkey Cyprus this time declared Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus. Actually, nothing changed in terms of domestic settings. But this time, Turkey Cypriots officially demand international recognition. Uh, unfortunately, three days after of this uh, declaration, uh, United Nations Security Council uh, meet with rocket speed and uh, something we never see in the modern era, actually, five Security Council members agreed upon the same point, which is very unlikely. So uh, the, the infamous decisions of uh, 541 uh, revealed, and it's said that there's only one state in the Republic of Cyprus, so Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus shouldn't be recognized. And then the problem continue up to this day. But my point is that when we look at to the contemporary world, we see that there are many failed states. There are many states who actually recognize states, but cannot have any, any order, like Venezuela, like Syria, like many countries in, you know, in Africa, in Asia. But when you look at the TRNC, although we have many problems, although we are not internationally recognized, we exist. We, we control our territories. Uh, we have very democratic system. We are we, we are repeating, you know, uh, democratically elected elections. We have representatives in more than uh, 20 countries. Uh, we have well protected boundaries. We have population. So, although the only part that is missing is international recognition, Turkish Cypriots are actually fulfilling all the other criteria of to be a statehood. And even in the uh, very uh, turbulent times like pandemic era. The Turkish Cypriot government able to pay the wages, uh, able to continue its uh, activities, its services. And now, uh, whether the international community recognizes Terence or not, I, I see this from, uh, for example, the United Nations Security Council recent uh, statement on the Warosha, for instance. I see that now the international community, step by step, is coming to the point that there is a Turkish Cypriot state. So we got, we start to get some respect from international community. When you look at the drilling areas of the Greek Cypriot government, you see that none of them is in the north, none of them is in the any area that could clash with the TRNC. So actually, secretly, also this means that Greek Cypriot government is also recognizing Turkish Cypriot, uh, you know, area and zone. Um, the bomb, uh, yes. Uh, Professor Ishiksal, thank you for this, I think, framework yeah. that you have provided so far to understand the dynamics uh, mm -hmm. in the Cyprus issue. But can you please refresh our memory that Turkish Cypriots really invested in diplomatic efforts to a large extent, and in 2004, there was an NM plan that the Turkish yeah. side said yes, but the Greek side uh, said, I think, no, and with yeah. a large margin, as far as I remember. Yeah. You know, what were the main parameters of this agreement and why the rejection came from the uh, Cypriot side, Greek side? Uh, sorry. Yes, a very, very good question. Um, 2004 was a historic opportunity, uh, honestly speaking. And uh, the plan, uh, which is called Annan plan because of the Secretary General Annan uh, prepared the plan, uh, the, the plan that we voted in 2004 uh, were actually the fifth version. So I, I'm underlining this fact because the plan coming from come and go diplomacy and it prepared as a as a five as a fifth version. So uh, what basically the secretary general do uh, debate with both sides, take their red points, reconsider it, redraft it, then again talk with this side. So the process continued like this almost four years. So when we look at the plan back now. Uh, Accordingly, it was a disaster plan for Turkish Cypriots because now when we interpret it as a, as a let's say, with, with, with more calm mood, we can see that there is a very dangerous clause. For instance, it says that the Turkish soldiers have to leave Ireland, which is the main security of the Turkish Cypriots, by the year of 2018 or 
whenever Turkey enters the European Union. So uh, during that time, there was the atmosphere that Turkey will be entered to the European Union very soon, which was a, uh, actually a big cheating. But uh, uh, if you accept the plan, for example, by 2018, which is two years ago, there will be very symbolic, like 650 soldiers will remain in the island. So when we look at the other clause, actually, the, the Annan plan uh, talking about bi-zonal, uh, bi-federal federation, it calls reduction of the Turkish property, Turkish land, actually, from um, 35% uh, to 29%. So it's actually a, a, a significant reducement, uh, uh, sorry, from 36.5% to 29%, which means almost uh, one quarter of the TRNC will be given back will be given to the Greek Cypriots. So this was a big compromise from the Turkish side, uh, arguably. Uh, when you look at the other clause, we see that Greek Cypriots, who has been uh, settlers, who has to left their houses in the north, will somehow either will be given back their lands or they will be compensated. So there are no Greek Cypriot will be left that, 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 let's say, will be unhappy. So it has many positive clause for Greek Cypriots. It was calling a federation under single identity uh, as a single state with two uh, federal uh, counterparts. The main reason why Greek Cypriots rejected it is, uh, as I, you know, in my all writings articles, you know, I uh, frequently stress this. Greek Cypriots were and now actually still not ready to share uh, political power with the Turkish Cypriots. I For think that's them, a critical... I think that's yes. a critical observation because I was not going to just, you know, talk about the past. We, we should talk about the present and the prospects for the future yeah. because you were involved in the negotiations. And of course, you can read the minds of the, I think, Greek Cypriots there too. What are the chances for the future? I mean, it seems that uh, you are, uh, uh, you know, a little bit pessimistic about the diplomatic solutions based on the rights of two communities, you know, equal rights for the two communities. Well, my Greek Cypriot uh, counterparts don't like me much, <laughs> honestly speaking, because I have a nickname, uh, which is Argument Machine. Uh, my role was actually to uh, finding counter arguments of the Greek arguments, which is actually easily uh, defendable, because uh, the Greek Cypriots are tend to ignore many facts. They tend to ignore uh, international law. They tend to ignore any developments that not suit their interests. So uh, basically speaking, if I have to summarize, uh, in order to make a compromise in Cyprus, I mean, in, in any settlement, in, in any problem, one of the two sides should be compromised, should, uh, let's say, change its position. So uh, all my experience and all my um, uh, witnessing and all my uh, readings demonstrated that Greek Cypriots will not make any compromise. In other words, they will not make any step towards a solution. So they have very strict red lines, which is no Turkish soldiers, definitely will live in the island, no guarantees, no securities, and all the settlers, or the Greek Cypriot settlers, will have to turn back to their uh, to the north, which is very unacceptable for the Turkish side. So what the Greek Cypriots are expecting is, they are expecting a soft Turkish Cypriot administration, maybe, can give more compromise, so we can reach to an agreement. So this is their position. And uh, they are very patient. Let me tell you that. Greek Cypriot administration are very patient. They play into the time. In every negotiation table, we ask for time negotiations. We said that how long it will going to last. Because Turkish Cypriots are uh, Greek Cypriots political prisoners for more than 50 years. So we naturally ask how long this negotiation will continue. And Greek Cypriot administration never accept any time limits on negotiation. They said that it should be open-ending and that you cannot put us any dates on when it should be finished. So looking from this perspective, honestly speaking, I, I don't see any point of compromise because now uh, the Turkish Cypriot people accordingly are more aware of the facts. Now we have technology, uh, nothing keeps secrets actually anymore. And thanks, thankfully, also thankfully, I can say that uh, there is a shift on Turkish foreign policy, which is a, a big change. Because when we look at the Annan Plan era, Turkey gave a full support to Annan, Annan Plan era. I mean, the Turkish government, even the opposition, uh, they were uh, actually 
according to some uh, people, uh, also they make some pressure on the Turkish Cypriots to accept the plan. Uh, but now uh, we see that the Turkish administration and especially Turkish presidency uh, as are standing uh, very strong uh, with the Turkish Cypriots, and this gives more confidence to the Turkish Cypriots on the negotiation table. Right. I think uh, you have explained that the Greek Cypriots do have some maximalist claims and demands, which is not some you know acceptable in the international relations because you know as I said, negotiations require some sort of give in, you know, take and give, give and take issues. Yes. Uh, what is the position of the EU? Because it seems that the Greek Cypriots are not going to be willing to come to the table with some sort of, you know, uh, agreeable uh, conditions. Uh, that shows that they are, you know, quite self-confident in their own positions. You know, where do they get that self-confidence? Is it the, you know, Greek government, you know, mainland Greece, or is it the European Union or the international community? Where do they get such sort of self-confidence? Uh, first of all. Um... We know how the European Union is working, and uh, although there are many um, uh, clash of interests, they try to act one uh, when it comes to Cyprus issue against Turkey. So um, we know that now European Union cannot be a fair negotiator, cannot be a referee, cannot be an arbitrator. But Greek Cypriot uh, side insistingly uh, trying to put European Union into the picture. They, they try to say that, you know, let's European Union be the arbitrator and other things, but how come a European Union could be an arbitrator while the Greek Cypriot side are uh, part of the uh, European Union? Regarding your second question, uh, this is a not very well known fact in Turkey, and sometimes uh, it surprises me because the general tendency of Turkish media and Turkish academics is uh, Greek Cypriots are very small states, you know, uh, they don't have any power, you know, they back up with someone else, you know, this is the general attitude. But uh, I think uh, Turkish uh, academics should know a little bit more about the Greek Cypriot psychology and um, character. Uh, Greek Cypriot people are um, um, unbelievably self-confident people. I mean, in terms of administration, uh, in terms of when you see normal people, they really um, have a very strong uh, self-confidence. Uh, if it is clash with their interests, they can even clash with the Greeks, actually. Uh, so they are very good on diplomacy. The main uh, reason of this, why they are good on diplomacy is, whoever comes to the power in the Greek side, uh, form a negotiation team from all the parties, which is something very missing in Turkish Cypriot politics, because the Turkish Cypriot politics are very polarized, um, it's very uh, small politics, and unfortunately, we have too many political favorings, uh, corruptions. So whoever uh, chosen as a president uh, make his own team from the like likelihood people, likely-minded people. But in the Greek side, it's completely different. They are acting as one. They are acting as as unique. Whether you are communist or Elam, Elam, I mean fascist right, uh, they are all on the table, and they are acting as one. Right. Um, actually, you touched on uh, quite an interesting issue, the polarization of uh, uh, domestic politics in the Turkish side. Now, I think we should spend a little bit more time in the second part of our uh, discussion. Why there has been so much um, fragmentation in the uh, northern side, as far as Turkish politicians, uh, Cypriot Turkish politicians are concerned? Yeah, very good question, and you know, uh, we can spend hours and hours uh, debating this issue. It's not uh, actually uh, simple to uh, to explain, but let me start like this. Um, unfortunately, uh, because I, I, I am making too much contact, too much live connection with the Turkish TVs, uh, still they don't care about the internal dynamics of Turkish Cypriot politics. I mean, I don't know whether it's a big negligence or they don't really want to be, in, they are not really interested, but uh, Turkish Cypriot politics is much more complicated than, than uh, seen from the outside. So uh, it has a long history, but uh, let me start from the disc. Uh, first of all, uh, when you look at today's um, uh, Turkish Cypriot state, the people, very generally speaking, have two uh, different uh, histories. One people are called settlers, which, which are the people who were uh, settling in the north for 450 years. So these people, like my family, for instance, are uh, not mixed with the Greek Cypriots. 
So they they know no Greek almost. They have uh, no Greek friends, and they were mainly work on their own lands, like mainly as a peasants, and uh, they were not dependent to the Greek Cypriots in, by any means. So when you look at the general characteristic of these people, you see that um, you know they have distance relationship with with, with the Greeks and uh, they have more attachment to, to, to Turkey. When you look at the other uh, people who is coming from the, let's say, south after 74, you see that they were more mixed with the, with the Greeks. Uh, they were working, let's say, under the supervision of the Greeks or, or on the state or other things. And these people somehow have more romantic feelings and more romantic uh, memories. Uh, previous to 64. So they have a tendency of accusing Turkey actually or Turkey side for most of the problems and they also uh, promoting a Greek side argument, actually propaganda, that actually there is no very serious problem between Turkey and Greek Cypriots. It's a little bit exaggerated, you know, all these things. So there were always this group of people who always have a good relations with, with the Greek side. This is only one side of the story. When you look at the other side, uh, according to my view, uh, the main problem is with the uh, right wing of Turkey Cypriots. The right wing parties and politicians make too many mistakes. They involve in uh, some sort of corruptions. And because of this, although the Greek Cypriot side or let's say pro-Greek Cypriot or pro-federalist government, they don't need to do anything. They don't need to prove anything. They start to have a good support which comes naturally because of the mistakes of the right. So, for instance, um, when you look at the rightist parties, we see that um, academic qualification or educational qualification are not important. It, more important is networking. More important is your uh, how rich you are or how connections you are. When, but when you look at the left-wing politics, you see that they uh, give more emphasis to the education, to the representability and the other things. So this is a self critics that definitely a right wing parties should uh, should bring by themselves. Because when we look at the generations, uh, we see that while older generations who uh, experience uh, pre, uh, pre 74 era, they are they know what's going on and they they are more aware of the facts. But the young generation who didn't live with the Greek Cypriots. Uh, with the, they, they let's say brainwash with the idea that Greek Cypriots are very modern, very European society. Uh, they are having some problems in the past, but it will never uh, be repeated in the future. So to summarize, I think it's more related with materialistic uh, virtues because they see, you know, the the Greek Greek Cypriot side is more richer than the Turkish Cypriots. They are member of European Union and. Uh, they have this vision that uh, the Greeks are representing everything European, everything modern, and for them the Turkey is representing more traditional standing. Uh, but of course, this is only one side of the story. I mean, they don't able to get let's more critical discussions about identity, double standards, and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Well, that that it seems that the picture is more complicated than we see from outside. I think uh, right. you are right that we need to maybe engage more closely with the with the northern side to see the complexities of the domestic politics yesterday there was the first round of uh, presidential elections in the uh, turkish republic of northern cyprus the part the turnout rate was uh, 58 uh, percent yes. which is not very high i think uh, as far as i can see and ersin tatar received 22.3 percent mustafa 32.1 32, sorry, 32.3. Mustafa Akenji received 29.8 and uh, Tufan Erhurman received 21.6%. And the second round will be held on uh, 18th of October. So what is your uh, first uh, reaction to the results that we see, including the, the participation rate? Yeah, I mean, turnout rate is, is very low. Uh, it's only 58%. Some, uh, some uh, again, right-wing politicians try to interpret this because of the pandemic. Uh, but I don't agree with this point, uh, unfortunately, because uh, when you see the trend, we see that the turnout rates, which were more than 80s in the 90s, then it started to decline, like gradually. And uh, in the previous election, uh, it was 64%. And now reduced to 58 percent 
And uh, I think if this trend continues, maybe in the coming elections, we may encounter with the danger that uh, it could be go down below 50%. And if anybody elected uh, from a turnout of uh, below 50%, I think the legitimacy questions will automatically come. So main reason is this, as I just repeated, uh, because of the corruption uh, of the of the uh, politics, uh, many people are lost their hopes. So for them, uh, whoever get elected will not make any difference. This is one of the like main trends. Other point is that uh, because of the pandemic, uh, many uh, private sector people uh, lost their jobs and they have very uh, serious problems. Mm -hmm. And uh, they are accusing the government of only uh, concerning the rights of the government sector workers. So this is another big problem in Northern Cyprus because we are under the international isolations. Uh, we are under very serious uh, economic problems. But on the other hand, people who is working for the government as government employees, which is maybe more than 80%, uh, they, they, they always have a guarantee from the state. But for the private sector people, they have very crucial problems. And many private sector people openly declared from the social media that they will not attend to the elections because nobody is care about them. Uh, Professor Ishiksal, I just would like to ask a little bit more specific questions with regard to some of the claims that came mm -hmm. from politicians. Uh, yes. Mustafa Akunji stated that there was some sort of intervention uh, in his uh, candidacy. You know, where does the notion of electoral interference come from? And what do different Turkish Cypriots think about accusations of Turkish interference? And what are the evidence that they provide for this sort of uh, intervention? Yeah, very good question. Thank you for this question, because this is the one of the most debated issue uh, at, uh, for the elections, actually, for these elections. Well, I mean, um, when you look to official views, both from the TRNC and Turkey, the official views always say that there never have been any uh, involvement, any interruption to the elections. But when we look at some empirical evidences, uh, I can actually find some counter arguments. Uh, let me give you some example. Um, in 2000 uh, presidential elections, which is actually uh, for me pro the only case we can see, maybe we can say that there's a, some sort of intervention, because what happened is that two right-wing candidates, namely Rauf Tengtaş, uh, the uh, legendary leader of Turkish Cypriots, and Dervish Erolu, who was a um, um, prime minister at that time and the president of the National Unity Party. They both reached to the second round. And during that time, Turkish leftists, like the federationist side, uh, they give support to the Erolu because for them, uh, Denktaş should go by any means. And during that time, uh, just before the second round elections, um, Dervish Erolu announced that he will not attend to the second round. So up till this date, it remains as a sort of secret, as a as a conspiracy. Why Derish Erolu um, changed his mind and didn't attend the second election? Many people interpret this this as an uh, inter, uh, intervention of Turkey. That you know, um, the Turkish foreign policy think that Rauf Tengtaş should continue as an undisputed leader. This is the one empirical evidence. Second empirical evidence that, uh, which is every Turkish Cypriot is uh, well aware and uh, nobody forgot about these things. It happened in 2006. Uh, again, National Unity Party, which is a right wing party in the government. And during that time, let me remind you that it was post Annan era, where, you know, as I just mentioned, that Turkey is officially supporting the Annan pillar. Uh, Annan pillar. And um, in one night, um, suddenly, uh, two MPs from the National Unity Party, and let me tell you that in, in TRS Parliament, there are 50 members. But and, Mr. Ishiksa, uh, Professor yes. Ishiksa, this sort of you know uh, shifting from one political party to another takes place yes. almost everywhere, especially when there is so many or so much fragmentation in domestic politics. Now, mm. uh, sorry for interrupting you, but uh, I just want to move a little bit faster. Do you expect yeah. under the conditions, you know, you have described some of the things that mm -hmm. have happened in the past. Do you think Mustafa Akinci will withdraw from candidacy? No, if, if there is, definitely. you know, such sort of, uh, you know, belief that you know, no, Turkey I mean, is uh, intervening? Uh, let, let me uh, just finish my previous argument, because that uh, operation was actually done against the Nationalist Party. It's not the left leftist party, because in one night, like a party established, and that party found a coalition with the leftist uh, Republican Party. So my point is that 
Uh, now, uh, Mr. Akinci is is, is uh, settled all his uh, propaganda to the Turkish intervention. I mean, so-called Turkish intervention, which is definitely not exist. And the only empirical evidence that they put forward, which is uh, actually uh, is, is not a very reliable empirical evidence, but the only thing they say is that is the uh, calling of Mr. Tatar to the reopening of uh, water project uh, from Cyprus to Turkish, to, uh, from Turkey to uh, Cyprus, and announcement that Varosha will be opened. So they are just using this event, this historical event, as uh, Turkey put its uh, preference towards uh, Mr. Tatar. And apart from this, we don't see anything touchable. We don't see anything that really supports this argument. I think, you know, Mustafa Akinci, President Akinci, uh, has been well received in Turkey on many occasions, as far as I can yes, see, I mean, yes, uh, previously. So there was uh, respect by the Turkish government and the Turkish politicians because Mustafa Akinci was elected by the Turkish Cypriots. I mean, there is no, you know, a question of legitimacy. I mean, but later on, he made some statements favoring more, I think, Greek positions. And that yes. was a debate in Turkey, actually. Can you please tell us why he has done so? Well, um, you know, personally, I criticize too much uh, Mr. Akinci. And um, uh, I mean, um, he, unfortunately, he's not like uh, like a president who likes criticism, <laughs> I can say. So the, the, the one of the thing is, um, I mean, this is the something that I don't like about Turkish Cypriot political culture. culture. What is it is? They think that if they complain Turkey, especially to the outside uh, media, uh, they think that they will take uh, more credit from the Turkish Cypriots. I don't think well, this is a very let me, let me interrupt you. I think there is a similar <laughs> case within Turkey as well. Some of the Turkish politicians, yes, yes, yes. when they go out, you know, they always, you know, um, bash the current governments in Turkey so that maybe they can get some more credit and respect. But that doesn't happen. I mean, I have seen it myself when I was in politics. Exactly, because when you look at Mr. Akinci's statements, uh, he talked differently. I mean, when he talked to international media, he is more accusing of Turkey, of Turkish intervention, etc., etc. But when he talked to the Turkish Cypriot media, he is more, much more balanced, much more, uh, let's say, oriented. So it, it seems very interesting to me. I don't know. Uh, I think some of the advisor of Mr. Akinci should tell him that like this kind of complaining to the international media will not actually serving his interest because it's actually discrediting Turkish Cypriot's image, I think, uh, to the outside, which is something we really need to need to promote because Turkish Cypriot people are well-educated people, generally speaking. We have very high uh, university graduation rates. You know, uh, we are a democratic society. We never have any small, even small incident in the elections. No fight, nothing. So uh, instead of promoting these values and these facts, uh, when you always, you know, accusing Turkey and uh, try to create an image that you know Turkish Cypriot society is not a developed society, I don't think uh, fulfilling with any interest of anyone. Right now, a little bit more, maybe uh, trying to pick your brain on the uh, Akinci case. Mm -hmm. What is the main reason? Uh, as far as the dispute between Turkish government and the Akinci is concerned, I mean, why there has been such a change of mood on both sides? Well, actually, um, everything was going well. Uh, as you know, that we got two uh, significant negotiations, Cyprus uh, talks. Uh, one in was uh, Mont Pelerin, and the, the other was in Kran Montana. Uh, and up till that moment, uh, actually, uh, Academicians like me was watching with great concern because we were hearing that Akinci was uh, Akinci was giving big compromises, and then uh, afterwards, because uh, actually we learned everything from the Greek media, there was a, a big censorship on the Turkish media, Turkish uh, academia that we have no idea what's going on. But on the other hand, Greek civil administration was almost telling every little details to the media. So by just following the Greek media, we learned them. I think one of the turning point is uh, when Mr. Akinci uh, gave a map to the United Nations. Uh, that was a big, big mistake. That was a big uh, diplomatic mistake because in Cyprus negotiation process, we are debating on six main subjects and economics, European relations, security, land, property. So 
we have many things, uh, governance, like six main topics. And the only, let's say, advantage that, that the Turkish Cypriot side holds is the land. Because we're still controlling 65.5% uh, of the land. And Greek Cypriots demanded uh, withdrawal of the uh, of Turkey of, of the Turkey Cypriots giving more compromise on the land. So when Mr. Akinci gave this compromise and reduced the Turkey Cypriot land to the something like 29 percent, uh, almost like uh, one fifth of the TRNC given to the Greek side, uh, this was a big mistake because in order to give this map, you have to take something in return. But Turkish Cypriots did not get any guarantee from its from their Greek counterpart. For example, there was no guarantee of uh, rot rotundancy in the presidency on, on the rotation of the presidency. There is no guarantee on continuation of the security agreement and, co and, and whether Turkish soldiers will stay or not. There was no guarantee that Turkish Cypriots will be effectively uh, exist in the decision making process. But we give land for me for nothing. So after this big compromise, uh, we suddenly start, of course, both in the domestic politics and international politics, naturally, uh, critics uh, come to Mr. Akpinji. And after that point, uh, he, uh, I think Mr. Akpinji lost the control a little bit. So he, he gives some uh, speeches, which is uh, well beyond its limits. And then after this, apparently, um, uh, the, the links between Turkey and I can just start to break down. Right uh, now, I think uh, let's have some kind of prophecy for the future, if we can. <laughs> now, you said that Mustafa Akinji is uh, someone who has compromised more. At, I mean, evidence suggests at least. Uh, you know, next week we will have the second round of the uh, elections and it will be contested between Ersin Tatar and Mustafa Akinji. What will be the future look like if Ersin Tatarji wins or Mustafa Akinci wins? What sort of differences we will see? The direction of well, the uh, uh, politics. Well, we are not not the future tellers, as you know. But uh, with our expertise and uh, what we can see, what's going on, I think we can make some predictions. Uh, first of all, let's start with Mr. Akinci. If Mr. Akinji wins, uh, for me, uh, again, uh, there will be maybe new uh, set of meetings uh, under the supervision of United Nations. But as I just explained, uh, Greek Cypriot side will not make any compromise from their red lines, and they will expect uh, Mr. Akinji to give much more compromise. And after this point, actually, there is no compromise left that uh, Mr. Akinji can give. And especially, uh, the, the further compromise that Mustafa Akinci gave is not at his hand because it directly uh, clash with the interest of Turkey. So it falls within the Turkish red lines. It's no more longer than uh, just uh, uh, focusing on the Turkish Cypriots. For example, uh, Turkish uh, guarantee uh, as a guarantor power of Cyprus is not only hands, hands of uh, either Turkish or Greek Cypriots. It's uh, also domestic politics of Turkey. It will be the Turkish parliament who will decide whether the Turkish soldiers should be withdrawn from island or not. Same with the uh, shelf dispute, continental shelf dispute. Again, whatever the Turkish side or Greek side compromise, it will not make any difference on Turkish uh, uh, official arguments. So for me, it will be another uh, miss of five years uh, of uh, election of Mr. Akinci. With the, with, uh, on the other hand, if uh, Mr. Tatar elected, um, I think uh, it will be much more uh, different because uh, Ersin Tatar uh, officially uh, declared that uh, Turkish Cypriot side will not just ne uh, negotiate federal solution. There will be other alternatives on the table. For example, confederal solution, by state solution, or uh, recognition of TRNC and then future talks on the state versus state uh, basis negotiation. So I know that for many people it doesn't seem maybe possible, but I argue that um, sky is the limit because uh, when we look at the recent developments in international relations, um, I call it as post corona order, we see that now even the Security Council decisions doesn't mean anything in, in international relations. I mean, look at the uh, Golan Heights decision, look at the Jerusalem decision, look at the West Bank occupation of Israel. 
There are many Security Council decisions. Nobody is complying with this decision. Look at the Karabağ decision of uh, United Nations Security Council. Armenia is not um, giving any care or, or uh, uh, of this decision. So why we should be stay limited and you know we should why we don't go any forward of promotion of the of the TRNC? And let me uh, talk about this. Uh, because this is important. So we have we have only one minute to go, Professor. Okay, Shisa, I mean, TRNC, the recognition of TRNC may not be possible. But remember, in the Annan plan, where the Turkish Cypriots say yes, we our name was Turkish Cypriot state. And with the changing of this Turkish Cypriot state, with the rights given to the Annan plan, I think a new uh, gateway could open to the Turkish Cypriots. And with the effective uh, support of Turkey and with the Turkish world, especially Azerbaijan, uh, after sorting out this Karabağ issue, I think nothing is impossible. Well, Mr. Uh, Hussein Ishiksal, thank you very much for joining us today. We have uh, enjoyed your uh, analysis and the insights on the Cyprus issue as well as domestic politics in the northern uh, Cyprus. Thank you very much. And we goodbye to all our viewers from this uh, debate. We hope to see you next time in another debate. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you.